Good evening. evening. Welcome to the Good Friday service. We pray that you all have a blessed evening here. Shall we um, stand and do our call to worship? On this day we gather to remember Jesus, our Savior, who loved us and gave himself for us. Let us draw near in full assurance of God's endless love and mercy. Shall we sing hymn number 310? Shall we do our prayer of confession in unison? We confess in you, our Lord and Savior, that we have betrayed and denied you, forgotten and doubted you. When our faith is tested, we wonder where you are. When we see injustice in the world, we often stand by. We turn our back, we ignore the cries of others, we confess that again and again we deny you and betray you with our silence. When we fail to proclaim your good news, when we fail to live our and love our neighbor as ourselves, forgive us, O God, 
and help us to truly repent. Help us to remember your sacrifice, your love, and to know your forgiveness. In the name of the one who lived, who was crucified, and who lives again, Jesus the Messiah, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Shall we turn in our hymnals to number 320, verses 1, 3, and 4. I'd like to read this evening from Luke 23, verses thir- starting with verse 32. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him, they said. He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine, vinegar, and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. I would like to have you all concentrate on the cross and visualize, if you will, that Christ is hanging there. And then ask yourself, which one am I, which sinner am I that Christ died for? Am I Judas Iscariot, who sold him out for 20 piece, or 30 pieces of silver? Am I the soldiers that came after him in the garden? and arrested him, and brought him to Pilate? Am I one of the disciples, Peter, who denied him three times? You can ask yourselves these questions, and so often I think we take them so lightly. We do not take really what the impact of 
Christ being crucified was. That impact affected not only Adam and Eve, but it affects everyone to the end of this age. Was I those people that sneered at him? Was I that man who handled that whip and drug it across his back until his back was bleeding? Was I the person that offered him vinegar was I one of the individuals who came up and accused him of blasphemy? Was I that soldier that took that spear and jammed it into his side? He probably thought, I'll just give it an extra push because I do not like this character. Was I one of the four soldiers that cast lots for his garment? Was I some of the people standing around there laughing at, at him because he said he could save others, but he couldn't save himself? Where do you fit into that picture? Which one of those people are you? Think about your daily living. What is your daily living like? And you can only answer that by yourself. I do not know you. I know myself. And if I really look at myself, I fit into that picture of me being one of those people that he died for on the cross. And so we have to ask ourselves, as Jesus is hanging there on the cross, really what is it to us? Is it just another Bible story? Is it just fiction that movie stars can get a role in a picture that is portrayed as a Bible story, and yet they falsify it? So ask yourself again. Am I part of this crucifixion? Was I there? Was I the high priest that got his ear cut off and Jesus healed it with a touch? Was I one of the 11 disciples that scattered when they came and they put him on the cross and crucified him? Were you Mary and Mary Magdalene kneeling at the cross, weeping, the only ones that stood by him? And I think so often in public life, when we leave church, we forget church. We forget about Jesus. We forget about the price that he paid for us so that we could have salvation. When we come back into church, we pick it up again. We have to live this 24-7, people. You have to live like you believe when you're sitting here this evening in church. You have to live like you believe that Jesus died for you. And when you're in public, you do the same. So think about it. Think about the price that Jesus paid, all the torture and all the torment that he went through. Many of us, if we'd have been spit on, and many of us, if we'd have been scourged, many of us, if we'd have had a spear jabbed in our, a jabbed in our side, if we had nails through our hands, nails through our feet, we would have said, hey, stop. I don't believe in that guy. So we have to come to the cross. Each day we have to come and ask God for forgiveness. That's what it was about. That's why he died. He died because of the sins that we commit daily. He died because of the sins that we are. The sins that we live out in our life, that's what he died for. He died for you, 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 and me. 
everybody. The soldiers that spat in his face, he died for them. Pilate and Caiaphas, he died for them. Judas, he died for him. They had a chance of salvation. We have that same chance. Are we going to accept it? We will start with the seven words on the cross, come up and speak into the mic, and if you need adjusting, I'll help you. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Jesus is looking down from the cross just after he was crucified between two criminals. He sees the soldiers who have mocked him, scourged him, and tortured him, and who have just nailed him to the cross. He probably remembers those who have sentenced him, Caiaphas and the high priests of the Sanhedrin. Pilate realized it was out of envy that they handed him over. But is Jesus not also thinking of his apostles and companions who have deserted him? To Peter, who has denied him three times, to the fickle crowd who day, only days before praised him on the entrance to Jerusalem and then days later chose him over Barabbas to be crucified? Is he thinking of us who daily forget him in our lives? Does he react angrily? No. At the height of his physical suffering, his love prevails and he asks his father to forgive. Could there, be, could there ever be greater irony? Jesus asks his father to forgive, but it is by his very sacrifice on the cross that mankind is able to be forgiven. Right up to his final hours on earth, Jesus preaches forgiveness. He teaches forgiveness in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. When asked by Peter, how many times should we forgive someone, Jesus answers 70 times 7. At the Last Supper, Jesus explains his crucifixion to his apostles when he tells them to drink from the cup. Drink, uh, drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many of, for the forgiveness of sins. He forgives the paralytic at Capernaum and the adulteress caught in the act and about to be stoned. And even following his resurrection, his, fir his first act is to commission his disciples to forgive. Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained.
the second word. Truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Gospel of Luke 23, verse 43. Now, it is not just the religious leaders or the soldiers that mock Jesus, but even one of the criminals, a downward progression of mockery. But the criminal on the right speaks up for Jesus, explaining the two criminals are receiving their just due, whereas this man has done nothing wrong. Then, turning to Jesus, he asks, Jesus, remember me when, you're king, when you come in your kingdom. Luke 23, verse 42. What wonderful faith this repentant sinner has in Jesus, far more than the doubting Thomas, one of his own apostles. Ignoring his own suffering, Jesus responds with love and mercy in his second word. The second word, again, is about forgiveness, this time directed to a sinner. Just as the first word, this biblical expression is found only in the Gospel of Luke. Jesus shows his divinity by opening heaven for a repentant sinner, such generosity to a man that only asked to be remembered. This expression offers us hope for salvation, for if we turn our hearts and prayers to him, we will also be with Jesus Christ at the end of our lives. The third word, Jesus said to his mother, Woman, this is your son. Then he said to the disciple, This is your mother. John 19, 26 through 27. Jesus and Mary are together again at the beginning of his mystery and ministry in Cana. 
and now at the end of his public ministry at the foot of the cross. The Lord refers to his mother as woman at the wedding feast of Cana, and in this passage, recalling the woman in Genesis 3.15, the first messianic pro prophecy of the Redeemer, and anticipating the woman clothed in the sun in Revelation 12. What sorrow must fill Mary's heart to see her son mocked, tortured, and crucified. Once again, a sword pierces Mary's soul. We are reminded of the prediction of Simeon at the temple. There are four at the foot of the cross. Mary, his mother, John, the disciple whom he loved, Mary of Cleopas, his mother's sister, and Mary Magdalene. He addresses his third word to Mary and John, the only eyewitness of the gospel writers. But again, Jesus rises above the occasion, and his concerns are for the ones that love him. The good son that he is, Jesus is concerned about taking care of his mother. In fact, this passage offers proof that Jesus was the only child of Mary, because if he did have brothers or sisters, they would have provided for her. But Jesus looks to John to care for her. St. Joseph is noticeably absent. The historic paintings by Michelangelo and Raphael suggest Joseph was a considerably older man, and he probably had died by the time of the crucifixion, or else he would have been there to take care of Mary. Another striking phrase indicating Jesus was an only child is in Mark 6, verse 3, referring to Jesus. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? Now, if James, and Judas, and Simon were also natural sons of Mary, Jesus would not have been called the son of Mary, but rather one of the sons of Mary. The fourth word, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This was the only expression of Jesus in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark. Both Gospels related that it was in the ninth hour, after three hours of darkness, that Jesus cried out this fourth word. The ninth hour was three o'clock in Judea. After the fourth word, Mark related with a horrific sense of finality, and Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. One is struck by the anguished tone of this expression in contrast to the first three words of Jesus. 
This cry is from the painful heart of the human Jesus who, who must feel deserted by his Father and the Holy Spirit, not to mention his earthly companions, the apostles. As if to emphasize his loneliness, Mark even has his loved ones looking from afar, not close to him as in the Gospel of John. Jesus feels separated from his Father. He is now all alone, and he must face death, face death by himself. But it is not this exactly what happens to all of us when we die. We, too, are all alone at the time of death. Jesus completely lives the human experience as we do, and by doing so, frees us from the clutches of sin. His fourth word is the opening line of Psalm 22, and thus his cry from the cross recalls, recalls the cry of Israel and of all innocent persons who suffer. Psalm 22 of David makes a striking prophecy of the crucifixion of the Messiah at a time when crucifixion was not known to exist. They have pierced my hands and my feet. They have numbered all my bones. The psalmist continues, They divide my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. There cannot be a more dreadful moment in the history of man at this moment. Jesus, who came to save us, is crucified, and he realizes the horror of what is happening and what he is now in, is enduring. He is about to be engulfed in the raging sea of sin. Evil triumphs, as, as Jesus admits, but this is your hour, Luke 22, verse 53. But it is only for a moment. The burden of all the sins of humanity for a moment overwhelm the humanity of our Savior. But does this not have to happen? Does this not have to occur if Jesus is to save us? It is in defeat of his humanity that the divine plan of his Father will be completed. It is by his death that we are redeemed. For there is one God. There is also one mediator between God and the human race, Christ Jesus himself, who gave us as a ransom for all. The fifth word, I thirst. Gospel of John 19, verse 28. The fifth word of Jesus is his only human expression of physical suffering. Jesus is now in shock. The wounds inflicted upon him and the scourging, the crowning of thorns, and the nailing upon the cross are now taking their toll, especially after losing blood on a three-hour walk through the city of Jerusalem to Golgotha on the way of the cross. Systematic studies of the Shroud of Turin, as reported by Gerald O'Collins in Interpreting Jesus, indicate the passion of Jesus was far worse than one can imagine. The Shroud has been exhaustively studied by every possible scientific maneuver, and the, study, and the scientific burden of proof is now on those who do not accept the Shroud as the burial cloth of Jesus. He himself bore our sins in the body upon the cross, so that free from sin we might live for righteousness. 
By his wounds you have been healed. 1 Peter 2, verse 24. The sixth word, they put a sponge soaked in wine on the sprig of a hyssop and put it in his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and handed over the spirit. The Gospel of John 19, 29, and 30. John recalls the sacrifice of the Passover lamb in Exodus 12 in this passage. A hyssop is a small plant that was used to sprinkle the blood of the Passover lamb on the doorpost of the Hebrews. John's gospel related that it was the day of preparation, the day before the actual Passover, that Jesus was sent to death and sacrificed on the cross. John continues in 19, But when they came to Jesus and saw he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Recalling the instruction of Exodus 12:46 concerning the Passover lamb, he died in the ninth hour, about three o'clock in the afternoon. At the same time as the Passover lambs were slaughtered in the temple, Christ became the Passover lamb, as noted by St. Paul, for Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed in 1 Corinthians. The innocent lamb was slain for our sins so that we might be forgiven. The sixth word is Jesus' recognition that his suffering is over and his task is completed. Jesus is obedient to the Father and gives his love for mankind by redeeming us and his death on the cross. And the Gospels as a group captured this paradox. The synoptic Gospels narrated the horror of this event, the agony in the garden, the abandonment by his apostles, the trail before the Sanhedrin, the intense mockery and torture heaped upon Jesus, his suffering all alone, the darkness over the land, and his death, starkly portrayed both Matthew, both by Matthew and John. In contrast, the passion of Jesus in the Gospel of John expresses his kingship and proves to be his triumphant road to glory. John presents Jesus as directing the way, the action, the entire way. The phrase, it is finished, carries a sense of accomplishment. In John, there is no trial before the Sanhedrin, and gone are the repeated mockeries and scoring. But rather, Jesus is introduced at the Roman trial as, Behold your king, in John 19 and 14. Jesus is not stumbling or falling, as in the Gospels, but the way of the cross is presented with majesty and dignity, for Jesus went out bearing his own cross. And in John, the inscription at the head of the cross, I-N-R-I, is Latin for Jesus of Nazareth, the King of Jews. The loved ones of Jesus are with him, and he decisively gives his mother Mary the, dis the disciple who loved him. When Jesus died, he handed over the spirit. Jesus remained in control till the end, and it is he who handed over his spirit. This may also be interpreted as his death brought forth before the Holy Spirit. The Gospel of John gradually reveals the Holy Spirit, 
Jesus mentions living water in John when he meets the Samaritan woman at the well and during the Feast of Tabernacles refers to living water as the Holy Spirit. At the Last Supper, Christ announces he would ask the Father to send another advocate to be with you always, Spirit of Truth. The word advocate is also translated to comforter, helper, paraclete, or counselor, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. The symbolism of the water for the Holy Spirit becomes more evident in John. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spirit, with a spear, and immediately there came out blood and water. The piercing of his side fulfills the prophecy in Zechariah 12:10. They will look on me whom they have pierced. The piercing of Jesus' side prefigures the sacraments of the Eucharist, the blood, and the baptism, the water, as well as the beginning of the church. The seventh word, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Gospel of Luke 23, verse 46. The seventh word of Jesus is from the Gospel of Luke and is directed to the Father in heaven just before he dies. Jesus recalls Psalm 31, verse 5. Into thy hands I commend my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. 
Luke repeatedly pleads Jesus' innocence with Pilate through Dismas, the criminal, and immediately after his death with the centurion. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God and said, Certainly this man was innocent. Jesus was obedient to his father to the end, and his final word before his death on the cross was a prayer to his father. Jesus fulfilled his mission. They are justified by his grace as a gift through, through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as an expiation by his blood to be received by faith. The relationship of Jesus to the Father is revealed in the Gospel of John, for he remarked, The Father and I are one. And again at the Last Supper, do you not believe I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you I do not speak on my own. The Father who dwells in me is doing his works, and he can return. I came from the Father and have come into this world. Again, I am leaving the world and going to the Father. Jesus practiced what he preached. Greater love has no man than this that a man lay down his life for his friends. At this time, we'll have the draping of the cross and stripping the pulpit. I'd like to ask the consistory people to come up and help with that. And anybody else who would like to help, you sure may. Can somebody shut the lights out, please? Just shut them all out, if you would, please.
anybody would so desire to go up and kneel at the cross, you sure may do it at this time. 